Thank you, <coughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and now, um, Kathy Kobler, whose words I stole earlier, um, is going to talk to us about care of families and and children and babies, the tiniest of the tiny in my mind. <laughs> yes, you want to use that mic? Thank you. I'll use this mic if that's okay. And I am um, beyond grateful to the planning committee for recognizing the need to have the littlest of patients at the table, and I am so grateful um, to be able to represent them. So when we think about serious illness for perinatal and neonatal um, patients, we see them really in three main categories. Those are those families who are going in for routine prenatal care, and scanning or testing shows that the baby is going to have a serious medical condition that will impact living or may even be very life-limiting. We see babies who are born at um, the cusp of viability. So they're born very premature, and their bodies are perfectly formed, but their lungs aren't strong enough to sustain their living for a very long period of time. And then we have those babies who, because of their serious medical conditions, end up in neonatal units, and they receive lots of things that are done to them um, and for them, but at some point, their bodies may reach the point that they cannot um, stay much longer with us. And if you look at the leading causes of infant death, these are 2014 statistics, you'll see that overall for infants um, from birth to one year of age, congenital malformations, chromosomal abnormalities are at the top of the list. In the neonatal period of, uh, from birth to um, 28 days of living, those um, uh, Babies become number two on the list, and prematurity becomes the number one cause that leads to end of life. And then from 28 days to a year of, uh, of age, congenital malformations, abnormalities of their chromosomes that we can't change or fix become that number one cause. And the most interesting part of what I've learned for over 30 years of working with these families is that we're doing our best for many of these babies before they're even born to try to make sense of what's going on based on the medical technology and the ability that we have at hand um, to understand what their diagnosis is. And based on that diagnosis, how certain are we of how their care trajectory will unfold? And then really coupling that with what does it mean um, to the families to hear that news. In, within the United States, we're seeing a growing trend of perinatal palliative care programs to specifically address the needs of those families who hear before birth that their maybe, baby may not live long. And Dr. Charlotte Wool and her colleagues have given us a wonderful benchmark study where they um, heard back from 75 different programs that encompass 30 states, and we see that perinatal palliative care is, is growing, and it's being delivered not only in academic centers, but in community facilities with the, the help of um, community palliative and hospice programs. There's a wide variety of ways the, the programs are reporting how they're delivering that care. But I, I love the fact that 100% of them are realizing that these journeys for families that hear very unexpected news, that their baby may not live long, that these programs are attending to their spiritual needs and to the fact that both grief and hope intertwine in these moments as families are waiting for their little ones to be born. And what we see come through loud and clear about these programs that it is an interdisciplinary team approach and that many of these programs have coordinators of care that are often nurses, chaplains, or social workers who become that key point person, that navigator for the family as they take in medical information and then make decisions. And that how many of these programs are less than 10 years old. So this really is the baby portion of palliative care as it's unfolding. And right now we just do not have the tools at hand to measure are we really meeting families needs and in this um, study a third of the programs had formal measures so this is one of the qualitative studies that's come come has has come through from um, Dr. Cote Arsena and her colleague, Dr. Denny Kolsch. And I love the, the main thing that came through that parents said they were working through this experience so that they would have no regrets, that they needed healthcare teams that would help them navigate what it was going to mean to bring a baby into the world who may not live long or who would have co very complicating medical courses. They needed help with understanding the extent of the, of the, of the 
their child's medical condition and what it would mean to live well, even if that living was just in a few minutes. And that these families said loud and clear they want um, time to, to be connected in relationship, to prepare, um, and to be able to advocate. And I think that's one of the most important things I learned is these couples often are first-time parents, and they're trying to figure out what does this role mean for me to parent my child. And on top of that, they're having to do that within the context of very complex medical information that's coming to them, and they're, they're working to make decisions from a very deep place in their heart. And so the work that we do at our Center for Fetal Care, what my palliative uh, care colleagues are doing around the country for these families, is really working to establish early relationship. Some of these uh, babies, after they're born, are going to need medical care for quite some time. And so being able to introduce them early to their pediatric team members, giving families those options before the babies are even born to connect with the pediatric team, to engage in relationship. And we ask things like, help me to know what does this pregnancy mean to you? And for some of the couples I have meet who have struggled for, with years of infertility, I hear very important information in that question alone of how they're valuing and waiting for their little one. We look for what does this diagnosis mean to them and what are they expecting to happen for their child. And we're holding in mind their cultural and spiritual beliefs as well. I remember one mother who told me um, she was feeling very guilty that her baby had a, a chromosome abnormality that they found out before birth. And when I asked her to share a little bit more about that, she said she was feeling guilty because she felt like she ate too many hot foods instead of cold foods or something within their, her cultural tradition. And she thought that she caused what was going on with her baby. And that was important for us to know as we moved forward with making decisions. So we work to co-create goals of care. And it takes our entire team working together in the course over time. And we address the needs not only of the parents, but of those big brothers and sisters who are waiting to welcome those babies into the family. And we're weighing what families' hopes and expectations and preferences of care are with what we know would be medically feasible or possible and trying to find the way to meet in the middle. And again, some of these decision makings are happening before the baby are even fully before us. So we recognize that we're going to be shifting in our goals, that there may be times that on the spot we're making changes. <laughs> so, so parents have graciously given me permission to share some of their words. And I was so struck when this father said this to me. They, they came to our Center for Fetal Care after already speaking to an obstetrician, to another maternal fetal medicine specialist. And this father was so tuned into, I get that she's going to die at some point, but please, please, let's talk about the living. Will you do that with me? And I said, absolutely. So at our Center for Fetal Care, we make sure that all families have the opportunities to speak to a neonatologist who can say, what will babies living look like based on the medical conditions that we believe are going on? And giving them the opportunity, like I said, to connect with the pediatric specialist before the baby is born. And our crafting of these plans of care often happen over weeks or months, ideally, um, because these women are finding out the news usually around 18 to 20 weeks in their um, prenatal, regular prenatal care. And so they have quite some time until the 40-week mark when their baby's going to be born. We pull in if families have questions about what it means to Many of them are first-time moms. I've never been through labor before. So we work to make individualized childbirth education available to them. If they have questions about being able to breastfeed or store their breast milk, we hook them up with our lactation team, as well as pull in our child life specialists to help those big brothers and sisters be ready. And we work to disseminate that plan of care so that all team members in labor and delivery, in the neonatal intensive care unit, all the specialists are full aware of what parents say, this is important for me, um, this is what I'm hoping for, and what the team is agreeing on will be the plan of care. This is another um, 
qualitative study that was done looking at mothers' stories about what it meant to know that their baby may not live long after delivery. And for them, their goals were to be able to protect their babies, to um, shelter them from as much suffering as possible. They wanted to nurture them and do all those normal parenting skills of taking care of their child's body um, and, and treasuring them as a parent. They wanted to socialize and share their babies with others. And they, um, in this study, it came out that those final acts, those final moments of being with their baby after death were very important. And I really love the recommendation in this study <clears throat> that mothers should be provide every opportunity to care for their babies in ways that are normal and natural to them. And so that's what we do when we're create, creating these plans of care. And I won't go into the details of them, but as any mother would with a birth plan, we're capturing components of what that mother says would be important to her for um, her personal care, coupled with how does she want to treasure these moments um, before the baby is born. And then we're looking at, um, let's see, I think I skipped one. You know how moms nest at home and they get things ready um, to bring the baby home and take care. I had one um, mother tell me that making this plan of care, because she knew she'd never take her baby home, was her form of nesting. And so in the neonatal portion of these birth plans, we're, we're talking about some of the medical things, what we will offer, um, what would be feasible based on the parents' goals of care, how many medical interventions, what type of resuscitation efforts. We want to spell those out clearly for our team members who will be in the delivery room. And we want to look at many parents want to be sure. Can, can we please be sure before we make more decisions that the diagnoses that you made before the baby is born matches what's really going on when baby's here. So sometimes we're doing um, follow-up testing, and we look at ways where should baby be cared for. And I have so appreciated over the years at, at my site how our labor and delivery and NICU teams and postpartum teams work so beautifully together because sometimes all of baby's care happens right in parents' arms, and they never go to a neonatal setting or in, an, in a regular newborn nursery. And we talk about what will, what will it mean if um, baby continues to survive and thrive and mom is ready to go home for delivery. Does baby go home with mom with the collaboration of some of our community palliative care teams? Or where should that side of care be? And then some, some parents are really open to going into the discussion of, if my baby does not live long, what will those um, important things be? Um, so we incorporate that in the plan as well. So once baby is born, we often take the approach of letting baby lead the way. Because again, we've made the be best guesses ahead of time and tried to make plans, but we want to let baby lead the way, and we're doing the best within our palliative service and in collaboration with our neonatology colleagues to anticipate symptoms and treat those astutely. We are constantly assessing and, and re-focusing um, with families, all within a family-centered approach, honoring their wishes and preferences along the way. And for those babies that are in neonatal settings, again, this is a, a discussion that could take us all day about what the full scope of neonatal palliative care, but it encompasses that art of medically managing and optimizing comfort and quality of care while also facilitating ongoing goals and plan of care discussions within the context of a team. And throughout it all, the common thread is that of honoring relationship and hope. There's a very dear family that I'm working with right now. And as we were together on Monday and they were taking in the scope of their little boy's very serious medical illness, the mother um, looked up at me and very earnestly said, you know, to, to, to th through it all, Kathy, what I'm really trying to do is I want to make decisions for him in a way that would be um, what he would decide if he could tell us what he wants. And I just thought that was so poignant. And um, that, that became a theme then as we continued our discussions and interactions together. So we watch for within this work when shifts occur. We are trying to, and sometimes those shifts are that babies are doing much better than we anticipated. So families that don't even have a, a 
a crib at home or a car seat, um, have to start to think about what might it mean if baby does go home. Or for those um, children that are doing, um, showing us that their trajectory is, is heading towards an end of living situation, we're starting to ask important questions about um, next steps in their care. Where should they be cared for? Is the hospital the place for that? Can they go home? What facilities um, might be able to meet families' needs? What should be added or changed to baby's care, and who else should be involved? And again, it's with that ongoing um, aspect of what is most important. So um, part of what I feel so connected to in this work is that um, goal of wanting to make sure that families feel safe and held and be able to do that which is most important to them in the context of serious illness. So the top picture, when we asked one family what's most important, they wanted to take their baby who had been in an NICU unit for many months out to see the sunshine. And in making a way for that to happen, and so we had baby um, in mom's arms on a ventilator with a full team behind. I was the first one out on our hospital patio, and there was a mama robin who started angrily squawking at us and, and looking, and I said to her, mama, you got to behave because we got someone who needs to come out and enjoy the sunshine with you. And do you know that mother robin came from as far as we are to each other and sat and didn't move for 45 minutes and sang to that family? Um, so I found that in those moments when we can create those safe havens, beautiful things on fold. Like the picture, this is in one of our, um, outside of one of our private rooms in the NICU. Um, this is a family that felt so at home, they all took off their shoes before entering in. And you see the nurses on the outside. I love that you can see them in their, their medical um, scrubs and their shoes wondering, do I take my shoes off? Do I come in? Do we respect that space? Um, you know, so that is, is part of the goal that we're working towards. And as we honor relationship, we continue to ask what's most important. These images are, um, the result of a very wise nurse listening closely to a parent who was anticipating having her baby home for Christmas. And that nurse was quite aware, aware that because of um, baby's serious medical condition, that probably wasn't going to be possible. So we brought Christmas to her. And um, we created ornaments with baby's footprints. And once we got Christmas thought through, um, they said, well, what about Easter? And so they created um, some items that were helpful for Easter. And so this aspect one of the things that I've been involved in from a scholarly perspective is looking at ritual. And, you know, we all have a deep human need to want to make sense and to acknowledge when important things happen in our lives. And I'm very intrigued by the way that ritual and honoring those meaningful moments has a place for all of the children in our care. And it's transforming not only for the child and for the family, but for the team as well. And so sometimes ritual in my world looks like incorporating storybooks that families would already be reading but they do amazing things with those opportunities. And I think especially of one mother who um, read Goodnight Moon over the phone to her baby in the NICU and also to her other children at home. And so when it came time for baby's end of life to unfold, the family brought in their dog-eared copy of Goodnight Moon, and that's what they wanted to read before the ventilator tubing was removed, except they changed the words. And they said, Good night, NICU. Good night, beeps and buzzes. Good night, nurses that we love. And so I cannot say enough about my colleagues, the physicians, the nurses, chaplains, social workers, child life specialists, um, lactation consultants, all who come alongside families. Our goal is that we can help them find that centered place in the middle of the storm. And so our teams, we pay close attention to them. This is some information taken from an article after a case study I wrote with one of the most um, impactful end of life situations I watched ever unfold in our unit. And when we asked um, team members, they said, can you bring a ritual to us? And we asked them to ground themselves by holding on to something in the unit. Guess what they held on to? Each other. And the importance of recognizing that within this work of taking care of perinatal and neonatal patients, um, that taking care of our team members and offering them opportunities to um, be mindful of their own resiliency and their own needs is very important. 
And I leave you with one last story that really um, encompasses the trajectory of this care. So as a father, as I was doing um, prenatal planning with him, I asked him what was most important, and he, I remember him pointing his finger at me, you put in that plan, Kathy, you put in that plan that I'm going to sing to my girl when she's born. And so as I often do, I said, well, tell me more about that. And he went on to share, you know what, she is going to be born and in a room full of strangers. And we don't know how long her living will be, but I'm getting her used to my voice. And his wife's like, oh, let me tell you what he's doing. And so he started singing every night um, to the baby with inside, inside his wife. And um, so in the delivery room, this little one came out declaring life in a way we didn't anticipate. And after she was stabilized, I remember the neonatologist pushing out his arms and said, Dad, you're on. And Dad came up and he sang to his little girl. And for all the days and weeks and months that she was in our NICU, Dad sang to his little girl. And when she went home with the aid of an incredible home palliative care team that could meet their needs, Dad sang at home to his daughter. And when she came back into our PICU many months later, and it was very clear that she was at end of life, he pulled me aside. He said, Kathy, I'm going to need your help because we're going to sing, and you've got to help me start it because people are, might not be able to sing out loud. And then at her funeral, as he carried her casket out of the church, Dad started singing loud and clear, Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Papa's going to buy you a mockingbird. So this work is unfolding. I'm so beyond grateful again that babies are at the table. Um, I've tried to gather, I know these slides will be archived, some of the resources of what's available right now to care teams. I would recommend, if you want to look at anything, the perinatal hospice website started by Amy Kubelbeck is just a phenomenal gathering of resources, as well as the different statements that are available. The Hospice and Palliative Credentialing Center now has a certification for interdisciplinary team members who are engaged in this work to certify that they are um, competent and more than able. And um, just thank you again for the opportunity to be here today.